from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Ladies and gentlemen, um, it's my pleasure as Librarian of Congress to welcome you to invite those still coming in to step forward to plenty of seats up front. You're all welcome. And I want to say how glad we are to welcome you here this evening for the presentation of the 2010 Rebecca Johnson Babbitt National Prize for Poetry. Uh, the prize recognizes the most distinguished book of poetry by an American published during the preceding two years, or it can alternatively be a recognition for lifetime achievement of a distinguished poet. This year, the jurors recommended rewarding it for the book, a very outstanding one. Uh, now, before we begin, let me give you the ritual reminder to turn, please turn off cell phones and the other electronic equipment that may interfere with tonight's program or with the recording of this event for the library's archive. This is the 11th time that the Library of Congress has been privileged to award this prestigious biennial prize. Prior winners have been W.S. Merwin, B.H. Fairchild, Alice Fulton, David Ferry, Frank Bedard, Kenneth Koch, A.R. Ammons, Louise Gluck, and Mark Strand the same year, James Merrill, and Bob Hickok. We are indebted to the 2010 prize jurors who devoted time and energy very considerable to reading the multitude of submissions sent in by publishers. The jurors were Ellen Bass, poet, author, and professor of creative writing at Pacific University, Betty Sue Flowers, poet, critic, and recent past president of the Lyndon Bain Johnson Library in Austin, Texas, and Don Scher, senior editor of Poetry Magazine. My thanks to all the jurors for their devotion to the art of poetry and for the very serious and sustained deliberative process which they've conducted. The 2010 Rebecca Johnson Babbitt, Bobbitt, sorry, ooh, bad mistake, National Prize for Poetry is made possible by Dr. Philip C. Bobbitt. He is the Herbert Wexler Professor of Federal Jurisprudence at Columbia Law School and also serves as a senior fellow at the Robert S. Strauss Center for International Security and Law at the University of Texas. He's the author of several books on constitutional law, international security, and the history of strategy, including Terror and Consent, the Wars for the 21st Century, and the widely acclaimed The Shield of Achilles, War, Peace, and the Course of History. His writing, his teaching, and he himself embodies as well as honors and supports the humanistic adventure, the high standards that this prize represents. So I would like you all to join me in welcoming for some introductory remarks uh, to the podium for some remarks about the fascinating story of this prize, uh, the story that inspired it, and the man that has made it possible. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Philip Bobbitt. First, uh, Rebecca uh, Bobbitt National Prize for Poetry was given by the Library of Congress to James Merrill for his work, The Inner Room, published 21 years ago. Since then, 13 of these Beckys have gone to so distinguished a list that Robert Pinsky, the three-time poet laureate, said, and I quote, no other literary prize has set such a high standard. This year's winner, Lucia Perillo, rightly joins this remarkable collegium. It's been my very happy, my joyful pleasure 
these last two decades to say something at these gatherings about my family, especially about my mother, in whose honor this prize is presented. Becky Johnson of Johnson City, as she was when she met my father here at the Library of Congress in the 1930s. They were married a few years later, having eloped to Mexico. They lived together mainly in Texas for 40 years until my mother's death. When she died, I found a cache of some unusual index cards in a pigeonhole in her small green writing desk. Each card had a hole drilled in the center of the top line, and on each was typed poetry or a lofty saying. And there were dozens of them. I took them to my father and I asked him, what are all these cards? He said, you remember that I met your mother at the Library of Congress when we were both working our way through school. My father had won a scholarship to come east to college from Texas. It was the middle of the Depression. My mother was studying library science, as it was called then. Father said to me, you know your mother was engaged to another man when we first met. Yeah, I, I, I sort of remember that, yes. Well, I had to dislodge this fellow, but the only time I saw your mother was at work, and we had a very strict supervisor. We worked in cataloging. These cards are from the card catalog. Now, that explained the holes that were, in fact, at the bottom of the cards, not at the top. And we would exchange notes as if we were typing in reference information. I have to say, ever since I heard that story, I have a certain affection for librarians. <laughs> My father and I sat and we talked, and uh, out of that conversation came the idea of the Poetry Prize, which is now in its 21st year. 21. That glamorous number. It brings to mind the uh, 21 Club in New York, where my parents always had the table by the kitchen. And it reminds me of my 21st coming of age birthday, a party they threw for me in Austin, secretly flying in the girl from the East that I was dating. And of course, the gambler's favorite game, 21, which is really a two-person game. All these associations are not about one person, but always two. Two and one other, like the number itself. But who were the two, and who was the one in our family? Well, as an only child, I was the one, wasn't I? The two were my parents, who adhered to a pact I was never quite able to penetrate. On more than one occasion, mother or father would explain that the other spouse was the most important person in the family, and I had better get used to it. But of course, I didn't really want to break that pact. After a quarrel between them when I was about oh, five years old, I appeared with a suitcase, and I said that if they were going to divorce, I wasn't going to go with either one of them. <laughs> but in another sense, my father and I were the two, and my mother was the one. Uh, baffling all the more inscrutable because she was so abundantly forthright and outspoken. My father and I would look at each other in masculine solidarity when she said things like, it's just six of one and a dozen of the other. <laughs> or she'd say, cheap at half the price. Or when she tried to explain why she had two clocks in the kitchen. It was really only after she died that father and I realized that we had rather little in common and that what had bound us so tightly together was our love for my mother. And yet, in another way, my father was the one left out. He was the one who was away so often. My mother wrote him every night, and we would go down to the post office on 6th Street, where I would slip a letter to one of the men sorting mail in a huge, brightly lit cavern separated from the street by a chain-link shutter. He was the one who made the sacrifices, unknown to me, that kept us going, put me through Princeton, always subordinating his career to his family. But he was always home for Christmas. The Poetry Prize is a movable feast. Last year, it was uh, Halloween. This year, it comes to the Christmas season. 
So I thought I would close by describing a typical Christmas in our household. <laughs> Not that many of our Christmases were all that typical. After my grandmother's death in the 50s, my mother fell into a quarrel with God, and we stopped celebrating Christmases for a while. My father would take us to Acapulco for Christmas, and the nightclubs there didn't have much to do with Joseph and Mary, as I can recall. <laughs> but after a while, maybe on my account, we went back to Christmases in Austin. My parents had built a house. They designed it over a decade with bedrooms for me and my cousin Rodney and a room and bath for my Uncle Sam and a dining room with a 25-foot ceiling onto which a third-floor parlor looked. Every year, my closest friend, Paul, and I would go to a lot where Christmas trees were sold by what I now surmise was a criminal enterprise deforesting national parks. <laughs> because we waited so late in the season, I was always away at school and I was a terrible procrastinator. We were able to haggle for the largest trees, the, the ones that only banks and hotels bought, but they were still on the lot. Paul spoke good Spanish, and the one-eyed Mexican who ran the lot would finally break down in exasperation. We'd buy a tree for five or ten dollars and take it back to the house where a party of my friends was already underway. About 10 o'clock or so, my parents would go back to their wing of the house, the furthest possible point from Rodney's and my rooms, and the party would last uh, much of the night decorating the tree. Then at 3 or 4 in the morning, some daring person would lean over the third floor balcony and put the angel on the treetop. The lights would be turned off, and I would fetch my sleeping parents. In their robes, they would walk down the darkened gallery and stand in the dining room when someone would turn on the Christmas lights and everyone would cheer and clap and sing. Blinking and half asleep, my parents would pronounce this the best tree ever. Eggnog would be passed around or maybe champagne. And then they would disappear again as our party came to a slow close sometimes just as the sun was rising. That girl from the East I mentioned wrote me the other day, and she enclosed a number of memories of my mother. Here are a couple, and I'm quoting her now. She said, I imagine most of the people who will gather at the Library of Congress on December the 13th are keenly interested in poetry, and I know that your mother loved poetry, but if I could be there, I would say to them that your mother was more like the poem than the reader of poetry. When you were with her, it was necessary to cross over into a world that you could tell she found utterly usual, but you knew it was not usual. Once she'd been chatting to me about whatever we were doing or were about to do, and what struck me at the moment was a departure from that, like a dash in a sentence in which she said, I am just so pleased with my husband. It was a sharing between girlfriends, uh, said somewhat conspiratorially, surrounded by an aura that was not for anybody else's ears. I remember her hand held high when she said it, as if carried up by her joy and happiness, and I recall her raised arm, an unusual gesture, so it served to emphasize the departure from other times. I was a girl of 21 visiting you in Austin. I recall watching the sunsets out of big windows. You uh, and I and your parents sat down for a bridge, but you got a telephone call which interrupted our bidding, so the three of us sat at the table waiting for the fourth. Your mother said I had lovely hair, then she rose from her chair, walked behind me, and began scooping my hair in her hands for braiding this way and that. The bridge game petered out because your mother had completely abandoned herself to playing with my hair. She created braids and buns in a world insular to her and to me that while it lasted was inviolable, like the world you enter when a poem takes you. So, here we are, back at the Library of Congress, 
to celebrate another birthday of this wonderful prize, giving presents at that time of the year when a birthday is so joyfully celebrated. And tonight, we receive the nicest present of all, a reading from a prize-winning book by Lucia Perillo. I only wish I could have arranged a 21-gun salute. <laughs> Thank you, Philip, very much. This prize means a lot more than even the distinction of recognizing yet another great poet. And I'm pleased tonight to present the 2010 Bobbitt Prize to Lucia Perillo for the most distinguished book of poetry in the past two years, Inseminating the Elephant. Lucilla Perillo is the author of several books of poetry, Dangerous Life, that received the Norman Farber First Book Award from the Poetry Society, The Body Mutinies, which won the, the Penn Revson Foundation Poetry Fellowship, uh, The Oldest Map with the Name America, New and Selected Poems. This map, the 1507 Walsey Miller map, is of course in the library's collections and is on uh, perpetual display uh, in the Jefferson Building. And But Perillo's poem, moves the idea of that map into creative territory never imagined by the map maker. That was the first map of the New World, the first document that used the word America, of course. Um, <clears throat> but she moves it into a territory never imagined by the map maker or anyone else before. And her next book, Luck is Luck, won the Kingsley Tuff Awards. She's also a memoir. I've heard the vultures singing field notes on poetry, illness, and nature. She's contributed poems to the Atlantic, New Yorker, Kenyon Review, and other outlets. And her poems have appeared in all manner of distinguished anthologies. Now, she did not start out to be a poet. Her BA from McGill University was in wildlife management. And she worked for the US Fish and Wildlife Service. She also holds an MA in English from Syracuse University and taught at Southern Illinois University. In her 30s, she was diagnosed with an illness that she has written about with humor and honesty. Her poetry reveals a commitment to confront the corporality of experience even as she ponders the fuller meanings that might be lurking in the shadows of the harsh light that she shines on her subjects. Her witty pop culture references, though often humorous, also allude to more troubling questions of human durability and, and frailty. One of the many uh, uh, prize committees that have hailed and honored her work um, praised her corpus of poetry in these words. I'm quoting, Lucia Perillo examines popular culture, the limits of the human body, and the tragicomic experiences and aspects of everyday life and experience. So let us listen now to her presenting in her own unique idiom uh, her poetry, which is so deserving of this prize. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lucia Perillo. like to thank everybody for having me here, Phil Bobbitt and uh, Dr. Fillingsley. And um, uh, I was here last year, uh, so I had to watch myself on the computer to see what I read last year so I could pick out different things to read. But um, I, I want to start off um, with a poem. Do I sound OK? Uh, uh, that alludes to a famous poem by W.H. Auden, and some of you may not know that poem, so I'll try to say it. This is called uh, La Musée de Beaux-Arts, and um, it begins about suffering. They were never wrong, the old masters. 
how well they understood its human position, how it takes place while someone is eating or opening a window or just walking dully along, how as the aged are reverently, passionately awaiting the miraculous birth, there always must be children who did not specially want it to happen, skating on a pond at the edge of a wood. They never forgot that even the awful martyrdom must run its course anyhow in a corner, some untidy spot where the dogs go on with their doggy life and the torturer's horse scratches its innocent behind against a tree. In Bruegel's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. The plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for, for him it was not an, an important failure. The sun shone as it had to on the white legs disappearing into the green water and the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen something amazing, a boy falling out of the sky had somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on. So my poem alludes to that poem and um, many other, well, I, I guess after the fact I learned that Randall Jarrell has a famous poem that alludes to that poem as well, but um, I'll give you my poem, which is called Rebuttal. My quarrel with the old masters is they never made suffering big enough. That tiny leg sliding into the bay almost insults me, that it should be all we get of the falling boy after the half-hour stunt of his famous flying. Don't you see they are cartoons, the drunk hissed, in the British Museum, a drunk in a sport coat that made him look credible at first, some kind of docent, an itinerant purveyors of glosses that left me confused. I studied, Bruegel, I studied Bruegel's paintings, tiny skaters, and hunters come home with tiny dead animals, gutted outside the frame, where the tiny offal presumably had been left. I was looking for Icarus, but the Musée de Beaux-Arts is in Belgium, you twit. And so I did not see the plowman wearing his inexplicably dainty shoes. A cartoon, you American sow. And no one came to my rescue in that va gallery vacated even by its dust, where I also did not see the galleon anchored below the plowman's pasture with its oblivious content with being tiny sheep. But just wait until that ship sails out and encounters the kind of storm that'll require abstract expressionism to capture the full feeling of the giant canvases of the 20th century, swaths of color with no figures and in them at all. How immense the drowning when you're the boy who drowns between the fireball on your back and the water in front, all gray and everywhere and hard as concrete when you smack down. Now, I went to college up in Montreal, and um, when I was young, I had this um, shoplifting phase that I went through, <laughs> as many young people do. So this is, this is about those days up in, up in, uh, up in uh, Quebec, and it's called A Romance. I saw a child set down her binder like a wall, 
through the candy bin at the corner luncheonette so she could scoop out gum while she spoke to the clerk and from that moment was in love. Oh, theft. College was supposed to straighten me like a bent tree strangled by a wire. But being done with sweetness, I could not resist the lure of meat. How the red muscle gleamed in its shiny wrap, a wedge that had once been the thigh or the loin of a slow brute's body, sugar, dirt, and clotted grass, to be snatched in an instant and zipped into the croniest of pocketbooks. Radiance housed in raw hide again, as when it was living. A steak can be stuck in your jeans when you're skinny. A rump roast is right for a puffy down coat. Small chops will fit under a thin peasant blouse, where it falls off the breasts like a woodland river with a limestone amphitheater underneath. Ancient city, ancient sublet, ancient wooden fire escape. With my other bandits, I learned to say howdy-do in French. We were yanking on the cord that would start the motor of our lives, though we did not have the choke adjusted yet. Sometimes it seemed I floated in the dregs like a tea bag, bloating up with facts, until a girl ran in the door, panting hard, face red, slab thudding from her snowflake damasked waist onto the table, and we stood around it gawking at the way it seemed to breathe. Now, um, there's a, a sequence of poems in here from my days working for the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and I had the stupidest, stupidest job in the world at that, um, one of those institutions. It was called the Denver Wildlife Research Center and we did, it was my first job. And we did uh, pre animal damage control. Mm. which is a euphemism for killing things. So we <laughs> killed things to, so we could tell, you know, ranchers or farmers how to kill things. And um, my boss had figured out, though, how to kill vampire bats. And so he was a hero. Um, and he didn't have to do anything for the rest of his life because he had figured out how to solve the vampire bat problem in Bolivia. So we, we didn't really have to do anything. We, we, did, we just made up these ridiculous experiments. So this is about one of those experiments and it's called The Chamber. As does the poem by William Blake, this involves a poison worm a worm that would make the blackbird who ate it flap and squawk in distress. While at regular intervals, I played a tape of a bird also squawking in distress. So you see, there was the salt box girl regression going on. While I took notes, now the bird is squawking in distress. My job being to watch on closed circuit TV and record the bird's death were that to occur in the chamber made from a gutted fridge rid, rigged up to a button in the next room where when I pushed, I'd hear a musical plink over the loudspeaker as a mealworm dropped from a crown of vials that sat on the chamber, the crown rotating as the glass vials tipped, one worm per plink, though sometimes I plinked twice. If the worm got stuck or if the bird failed to squawk, 
in that tiny brick building that rustled with wings from birds scritching in cages I'd been filling for weeks. My truck full of traps I set on fence posts at dawn when the red wings clung to tall blades in the ditches and sang shuck shriek as the dirt road fumed behind me in mirrors while a head bore a rising red wing sun that I drove into. Feeling immortal, how could I not feel immortal when I was mistress of the poison worm? So, um, oh, this one's called Two of the Furies. I put these post-its in my book, and so now I sort of feel committed to the post-it. So I did it fairly arbitrarily, depending on what I read the last time I was here. Two of the Furies. The old woman in the walk parking lot wields her walker not unspryly, gray hair lank and without style, hanging under her ski hat as I wear a ski hat. Her legs bare under her skirt, my legs bare under her, my skirt. She wears sneakers, I wear sneakers, windbreaker, windbreaker. She rolls up to watch me board, as people do, because it is interesting to see the wheelchair maneuver backward into the van. You got it, she asks, as people do, though I am not their child. We are not sisters, either. Despite the winds ruffling our skirts in sink, Oh, how she is interested in the ruffling of my skirt. The ruffle makes her giddy, starts her bald gums racing on their wordless observations as she peers into my thighs. How alike we are, says this, no sister of mine to be argued with, just some crazy old woman flashing the terrible crater of her smile to raise the wind and prove her point. So let's see what we've got next. It's just, you know, we go to the next post-it. Then you're, oh, somebody said they wanted me to read this poem. So, um, when I, I, I went back to grad school, um, I didn't get into too many grad schools because I had never taken an English course. <laughs> and, um, but I did get into Syracuse. Um, see, up in Canada, if you could speak English, then you were ahead of the game. <laughs> so in Quebec. So um, I went to Syracuse and I took uh, my, uh, you know, I was eager to gallop through literary history, and I took a course in transcendentalism. Though um, this is largely fictional, partly fictional, I guess. The professor stabbed his chest with his hands curled like forks before coughing up the question that had dogged him since he first read Emerson. Why am I, I? Like musk oxen we hunkered while his lecture drifted against us like snow. If we could, we would have turned our backs into the wind. <laughs> I felt bad about his classes being such a snooze fest, though peaceful too a quiet little interlude from everyone outside, rooting up the corpse of literature for being too Caucasian. There was a simple answer to my own question, how come no one loved me stomping on the pedals of my little bicycle? I was insufferable. So too was Emerson, I bet, Though I liked 
if the red slayer think he slays. The professor drew a giant eyeball to depict the oversoul. Then he read a chapter from his own book, Nap Time. He didn't care if our heads tip forward on their stalks. When spring came, he even threw us a picnic in his yard where dogwood bloomed despite a few last dirty bergs of snow. He was, wo he was a wounded animal being chased across the tundra by those wolves, the postmodernists. <laughs> At any moment, you expected to see blood come dripping through his clothes. And I am I who never understood his question, though he let me climb to take a seat aboard the wooden scow he'd been building in the shade of 30-odd years. How I ever rode it from his yard into my life remains a mystery. The work is hard because the eyeball's heavy, riding in the bow. Um, oh yeah, this poem is called um, January slash Macy's slash the bra event. And um, I, I, in one review, it was sort of a so, lukewarm review, but the reviewer said that my titles were um, maybe juvenile. So um, then he said, like, there's one called January the Macy's, the bra event. That's the actual title or something like that. And I think that's a perfectly good title, you know, what's wrong? Because I've always been amazed at the, the um, in the advertisements, the, you know, we have to have a shoe event. We have to have a, so this is the bra event. <laughs> Word of it comes whispered by a slippery thin section of the paper where the models pantomime unruffled tete-a-tetes despite the absence of their blouses. Each year when my familiar latches on them so intently like a grandmaster plotting the white queen's path like a baby trying to suckle a whole roast beef I ask, what, you salt block, are you dreaming about being clubbed by thunderheads? But he will not say. Meanwhile, Capricorn's dark hours flabbed me, uneasy about surrendering to the expert fitter, even if the cupped hands were licensed and bonded. I had August in mind, seeing the pygmy goats at the county fair. Now the sky is having its daily rain event, and the trees are having their hibernal bark event, pretending they feel unruffled despite the absence of their leaves. And we forget how they looked, all flouncy and green. Instead, we regard fearfully the sway of their old trunks. Uh, this poem's called A Pedantry, and it, um, begins with a true factoid that hasn't been pointed out to uh, adequate notice, according to, in my opinion. A pedantry. Many of the Greek me, gre, me, many of the great men, Buddha, Saint Augustine, Jefferson, Einstein, had a woman and child they needed to ditch. A little prologue before the great accomplishments could happen. From nothing came this bloody turnip, 
umbilical to the once beloved. Only now she's transformed like a Hindu god with an animal snout and too many limbs. You'd rather board a steamer with chalk dust on your pants or sit under a bow tree and be pelted by flaming rocks. Renounce the flesh or ride off on a stallion. There is no papoose designed for such purposes. Plus, the baby would have to be sedated. Sorry, we don't want the future to fall into the hands of the wrong ists. That's how civilization came into being. For us who remained in the doorways of here, our companions, those kids who became chimney sweeps, car thieves, and makers of lace. By day, we live in the shadows of theories. By night, the moon holds us in its regard when it doesn't have more important business on the backside of the clouds. I didn't wear a watch and I forgot to borrow my husband's. So um, I'll read a tune. Oh, what time did I start? Oh, that's quarter off. Okay, I'm good. Okay, I'll I um I'll read two, I'll read uh, two new poems. Um, I read this amazing book recently, and it was made a documentary was made about it and it, it's called keep the river on your right and it was written by a guy named tobias schneebaum who uh wrote only a couple of books including you know one of which was keep the river on your right about um he was a was he a professor maybe in new york I don't know, and he decided that he needed to go off into the jungle in South America. He he lived in Brooklyn, I think. So he went and he went off and he found his way into a tribe of cannibals, and um, uh, it's it's just an amazing book and it's so well written. It's really well written, and I had no idea of it that of, of it and its quality i really do think it's good so read keep the river on your right i highly recommend it so this is again the body and it begins with an epigraph from schneebaum it says um i have become what i have always been and it has taken a lifetime all of my own life to reach this point where it is as if I know finally that I am alive and that I am here right now. When you spend many hours in a room alone, you have more than the usual chances to disgust yourself. This is the problem of the body, not that it is mortal, but that it is mortifying. When we were young, they taught us, do not touch it. But who can keep from touching it, from scratching the juicy scab? Today, I bit a thick hangnail and thought of Schneebaum, who walked four days into the jungle and stayed for the kindness of the tribe, who would have thought cannibals would be so tender. This could be any life. The vegetation is thick, and when there is an opening, you follow down its tunnel until one night you find yourself walking as on any night, though of a sudden your beloved friends are using their stone blades to split the skulls of other men. Gore everywhere, though the chunk of flesh I ate was bland. It was only when I chewed too far and bled that the taste turned 
satisfyingly salty. How difficult to be in a body, how easy to be repelled by it. Though Schneebaum regretted nothing, not even eating one-sixth of the human heart. Afterward, the hunters rested, their heads on each other's thighs, while the moon shined on the river, for the time it took to cross what narrow sky made its gash through the trees. And um, this other one, new one I'd like to read is called The Unturning. And it's uh, written for uh, my friend Ben Sonnenberg, who died this year. And he was the editor of Grand Street, which was a liter literary magazine he founded out, out of New York. My friend said, write about the dog in the Odyssey. 400 pages in. I found him lying on a dung heap where ticks sipped his blood. Though in his youth he'd taken down wild animals eager to kill for a man the gods favored. Who comes back in disguise. You expect the dog to give him away with a lick or a yip, but this is not what happens. Instead, we're told that death closed down his eyes. The instant he saw his master after 20 years away. And I wondered if my friend had played a trick, setting me up with this dog who does not do anything but die. When the gods turn away, what can we do but await their unturning? That means don't think that after so many years of having such a hard pillow, the dog wasn't grateful. But I wonder if for the sake of the shape of the plot, the author ought to have let him remain for another line or two if only to thump his tail. And um, then the last poem I'm going to read is my titled poem called Inseminating the Elephant. Now, I was reading at my, this bookstore my friend was working at in uh, north of Seattle, and he said that a woman came in. She had requested it. She couldn't come to the reading, and she said, unfortunate choice of title. So, um, and a student uh, who had uh, learning and social disabilities asked me at a reading that I did uh, recently at the uh, Pacific Loon L Lutheran University. He, he didn't know what inseminating meant, so I had to explain that, you know, it's the actual process. And then I was just interviewed for roll call, and the, the journalist asked me, too, he's, he said, well, is the title literal? Like, what are you talking about? And I said, yeah, it's about, it's, uh, this poem is about, um, this was, it was pretty well covered in the news. And if you got keyed into the story, it was hilarious, the process by which they inseminated the elephant in the zoo in Seattle because, I, I mean, pr the previous time they inseminated the elephant, they s sent it on a plane to St. Louis and back. So th this time, I mean, to let them do it the natural way, this time they just made it easier and did artificial insemination. But it was a very complicated procedure because of the female elephant's anatomy is very intricate. It was just to read about, anyway, how they how it was done was very funny. And um, so I think the poem t talks about the whole thing. And I talk about Tibetan Book of the Dead. I make a reference to Tibetan Book of the Dead. And I think that's the only, that's all you need to know.
inseminating the elephant. The zoologists who came from Germany wore bicycle helmets and protective rubber suits so as not to soil by substances that alchemized to produce laughter in the human species. How does that work biochemically is a question whose answer I have not found yet. But these are men whose language requires difficult conjugations under any circumstance. First, there's the matter of the enema, which ought to come as no surprise. Because what the news brings us is often wheelbarrows of dung, suffering with photographs. And so long as there is suffering, there should be also baby elephants, especially this messy headlamp lit calling forth. The problem lies in deciding which side to side with. It is natural to choose the giant rectal thermometer over the twisted human form, but is there something cowardly in that comic swerve? Hurry an elephant to carry the bundle of my pains, another with shiny clamps and calipers and the anodyne of laughter. So there, now I've alluded to my body that grows ever more inert, better not overdo, lest you get scared. The sorrowing world is way too big. How the zoologists start is by facing the mirror of her flanks, that foreboding luscious place where the gray hide gives way to a zeroing in of skin as vulnerable as an orchid, which is the place to enter provided you are brave, brave enough to insert your laser-guided camera to avoid the two false openings of her vestibule. Uh, Wait, sorry. To avoid the two false openings of her vestibule. I got to the very end of my reading without screwing up. Okay. To avoid the two false openings of her vestibule, much like the way of entering death, of giving birth to death, calling it forth as described in the Tibetan book. And are you brave enough to side with laughter if I face my purplish, raw reflection and attempt the difficult entry of that chamber where the seed pearl of my farce and equally opalescent sorrow lie waiting? And that's my conclusion. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Thank you. This comes almost as a uh, anticlimax, shall we say? But um, uh, uh, it is nonetheless my great honor and pleasure to, first of all, thank you for an extraordinary reading, for your wonderful presence, your, your humor, and your, the depth of feeling. And that's not the right phrase either, but still, um, it really is something that has intrigued us all. And so it's my pleasure to present you uh, with the sustain, the not cosmic but very much appreciated and deserved um, gift of the Robert Prize to oh, you for thank this you. for the year 2010, and I should say uh, not only with the thanks I know you all feel a uh, final round of applause, but also a reminder that she will be signing books uh, uh, whose title I need hardly remind you of. <laughs> at this, at this point, but whose contents will provide many, many 
rewards. Thank you for your presence, for your work, and This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.